phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Pray then like this, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father also will forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. My brothers and sisters in Christ, this is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Upon the mentioning of the Sermon on the Mount, the mind can conjure up images of childhood Sunday school classes in which we see our teachers go through the Beatitudes and hence explain how good little Christian boys and girls ought to behave. <laughs> Those images can extend into the developmental years to hear youth ministers explain how one was somehow blessed when their prejudiced peers did not accept them based upon their religious affiliation. But time has its way of growing and stretching a human person so that the wise generalities of the Beatitudes don't appear to be so general anymore. What seems at one time black and white becomes somewhat shady in the gray. But Jesus' seemingly gray teachings compiled in Matthew's Sermon on the Mount go beyond the Beatitudes to elaborate further on other difficult subjects, such as anger towards another person, or how about marriage and divorce, mm -hmm. the swearing of oaths, mm -hmm. and retaliation. At times, people find as if they have to twist their brains into somewhat of a first century pretzel in order to understand Jesus' teachings in light of their 21st century worldview. But this sermon contains sandwiched right in the middle another familiar passage of scripture, the Lord's Prayer, or as other traditions more fittingly call it, the Our Father. Today, let us look at the Our Father in a fresh and maybe a new perspective. A perspective that takes us off of the grassy slopes and Jesus' stony throne and takes us to Matthew's first readers 50 years later. Whatever our perspectives of the Sermon on the Mount may be, it is probably safe to assume that they do not collide with images of war. But to Matthew's first readers, they would have. Mm -hmm. When this gospel was written in the eighth decade of our common era, the Jews had suffered the defeat of war at the hand of the Romans, in which Jerusalem, the temple, the nerve center of the entire Jewish nation was obliterated by the Romans. In this bleak period of Jewish history, Jesus' teachings were offered to them like cool streams in a parched desert. Radical and revolutionary indeed they were. For it showed them that the earthly Jewish kingdom that would soon become a distant memory was not the kingdom they should be fighting for. But rather through a prayer, Jesus showed them how the true kingdom of God was built and what life in this kingdom entails. The book of Matthew was written to a Jewish audience. And so I invite you to open your minds and your hearts and with me read the Our Father from their perspective in order that we may glean from it a better understanding of the prayer our Savior has taught us to pray. Jesus begins this prayer by referring to God as our Father. 
And thus we begin with our first point, the one who is the sovereign of this kingdom. To the ears of a first century Jew, no other response would have been more appropriate than that of utter bewilderment. Entitling Yahweh as father was a concept completely foreign to a Jew. Sinai's personification of God was that of a bloodthirsty tyrant who was anything but personal. <clears throat> Yet, ironically, there are still hints of God as Father. Mm -hmm. On Sinai's claims, Israel was referred to as God's firstborn son. Of course, these seemingly barbaric images were softened by the psalmist as he referred to God as being as a father who has compassion on his children. And so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. But we must understand that these images are simply metaphorical. They're not relational. When Jesus presented God to us as father, he was giving to his audience something entirely new. That's right. But what about it was so new? Jesus was showing them a God who not only desired a parent-child relationship that radically transforms the child, but also a relationship that permeates every facet of the child's life. One commentator remarks, Father, for Jesus, means the one who loves, forgives, and knows how to give good gifts to God's children. God was no longer to be seen as an otherworldly figurehead outside of the sky somewhere to be afraid of. But rather, God was to be seen as one's father who desired relationship. Mm. Who with open arms wants to be our friend. Mm. Yes. It was revolutionary to Jesus' audience. It was revolutionary to Matthew's first readers. And so it is revolutionary to each and every one of us when we enter into what I call the Christ path. Before God comes to us, we are strangers to God. We do not recognize the need for God in our lives, much less do we see God as one who desires to have a relationship with us. But over time, our theologies grow. When we encounter firsthand the God experience, our perception of God evolves from that of stranger to heavenly father, divine friend. The secular has encountered the sacred. The common has encountered the uncommon. The holy has come to the profane. After Jesus introduced us to the one to whom we pray, we are then taught to make several petitions that can appear cryptic. Your kingdom come, your will be done. This brings us to our second point, the coming of this kingdom. We must still bear in mind that the ramifications of the Jewish war with the Romans were still felt by many when this gospel was written. To hear that they ought to pray for God's kingdom to come would have been easy for them in conception, but difficult in execution. Your kingdom come said to the Jewish war veterans that the kingdom of Israel was not the kingdom of God after all. Mm -hmm. And we can almost hear those Jewish war veterans say in response, but we fought hard. We put up a valiant effort. For what? If the nation of Israel was not God's kingdom, then just tell us what in God's name is. <laughs> Yet Jesus was suggesting something different. He wants us all to see, even today, that the kingdom of God is not initiated through warfare and bloodshed, but rather it is initiated through Christ himself. But I can't help but think that many Christians in our day are like those Jewish war veterans. They fight hard for what they perceive to be the kingdom of God. They put up a valiant effort to establish the kingdom of God in our world. However, it just doesn't work. 
United Methodist Bishop William Willimon reminds us, to all of us spiritual eager beavers and God go-getters, <laughs> it's a jolt to hear that the kingdom of God is something Christ does rather than something we do. <laughs> After all, the kingdom of God is not about what we want for our world. It's about what God wants for our world. It's not about what our will is being done. It's about God's will being done. And so we have been taught to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. We have discussed the sovereign of this kingdom and the coming of this kingdom. Now let us discuss life in this kingdom. The kingdom of God is a party. Mm -hmm. And thus we have the title of one of Tony Campolo's best selves. <laughs> Though Campolo's title is an attention grabber, it really is not that much of a stretch. Living within the kingdom of God is much like a party. It's a celebration of forgiveness and triumph over the fallen nature of our world. It is living within the reality of reconciliation to God and the redemption of the entire creation. We are taught to pray for our daily bread, mercies and graces from God that are new every morning. We are taught to pray for God's direction away from temptation and deliverance from evil, for without them, we would certainly fall. But the emphasis here lays undoubtedly on forgiveness. Forgiveness that extends between both God and to others. Fred Cronach has commented, God's forgiveness is unconditional, precedes human forgiveness to other human beings, and is its ground and its cause. Even after this prayer concludes, the teachings on forgiveness continue. Within the kingdom of God, forgiveness is of utmost importance. For the gospel itself is a gospel of forgiveness. Anglican Bishop M.T. Wright <coughs> says, well, a heart that will not open to forgive will remain closed when God's forgiveness is offered. Mm -hmm. For Matthew's first readers, this would have implied the forgiveness to the Romans. Mm -hmm. And for us, it implies forgiveness to all of those who have done us wrong. Mm -hmm. Though we are commanded to forgive those who do us wrong, surprisingly, we are not commanded to befriend them. Right. Right. <laughs> there are plenty of people who have done me wrong, and I have forgiven them. But that doesn't mean I like them. <laughs> and I won't even ask for a show of hands of those of you in this room who agree with me. <laughs> but when I think about this, I can't but also think of a story I once heard about 20th century theologian Karl Barth. When he was asked, do you think we will see those whom we love in heaven? Wow. Mm. Karl Barth said with a twinkle in his eye, yes, yes I do. And if I know Jesus, we will also see those we hate. Mm. <laughs> 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 <laughs>